have us speak to us about thrombotic microangiopathy today. Uh, second, uh, which is a perfect timing given that uh, it's nerve madness and thrombotic microangiopathy is one of the regions uh, in uh, in uh, nerve madness. So Dr. Java is a transplant nephrologist at the Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis. She's also the director of kidney transplantations uh, at the VA Medical Center in St. Louis. Uh, she's done her training in uh, medical school in India, internal medicine in Orlando, and a nephrology fellowship of uni at University of Oklahoma, and a transplant nephrology fellowship at WashU, where she is presently. In addition to that, she did a basic science research fellowship, I think four years, if I remember right, yeah. uh, under leadership of John Atkinson at Wash University, where she became a complementologist, uh, <laughs> an expert in complements. Uh, her research focus is on, you know, what she's going to talk about, of course, in the genetic variants in uh, complement-mediated diseases, including AHAS, uh, NC3, uh, glomerulopathy, preeclampsia. She's got uh, several uh, research awards. Uh, and uh, the um, uh, 2022 National Kidney Foundation Award of Excellence uh, for significant contributions to the field of kidney disease and the renal community. Uh, welcome, Anuja. Thank you, Swapnil. Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, and thanks for inviting me here today. I, it's an absolute pleasure to talk to you all about um, thrombotic microangiopathy, something I, I really enjoy taking care of patients and I'm really passionate about it. Um, like I was mentioning my video, if it, I can't see anybody. So if my video kind of goes off and on and it's bothering, just let me know, I'll turn it off. Um, so let me see. All right, are my slides moving? Did it, okay, good. So these are my disclosures. So for the talk today, my objectives are, I want to give start out with just a brief overview of the complement system, kind of discuss broadly about thrombotic microangiopathies, and then delve deeper into genetic testing, um, discussing who to test, what to order, when to test for, and then go into how do you interpret those genetic test results. I have a case that we'll go over. It's actually a transplant case. So it, it's actually interesting to know that we have an audience that takes care of uh, uh, transplant patients as well. So start out with the basics. You know, we know our immune system is our basic defense against pathogens, viruses, bacteria. Uh, there are two main components to our immune system, the innate immune system, which we are born with, um, and that is a key component of that is the complement system. And then the adaptive or the acquired immune system, which we develop through life as we get exposed to different infections and vaccinations, and a key component of our acquired immune system are the antibodies. So these antibodies are the specific, the acquired, and the more stable component, versus the complement is the non-specific, the innate, and the labile component. And complement is is being known to complement the function of the antibodies, which is why it that is exactly how it got its name. Now, the discovery, the credit of the discovery for this fascinating system actually goes to Jules Bourdais, who did the initial experiments in 1894 that identified this system. And the term complement was coined by Paul Ehrlich. But prior to that, this system was actually called a lexin. I don't really recall how that got its name, but if you can make the connection, the company that came up with the first drug, Alexion, got its name from this old term that complement was called as. And uh, Jules Bourdais actually received the Nobel Prize for his discovery of the system in 2019, uh, in 1919. And so it, 2019 was the 100th anniversary of him winning the Nobel Prize. So the systems, um, you know, as you know, there are three ways the system gets activated. There is the classical pathway, the lectin pathway, and the alternative pathway. The classical pathway gets activated whenever an antibody recognizes a foreign antigen and forms an immune complex. The lectin pathway is very similar to the classical pathway, and it'll get activated when lectins, which are proteins, recognize the carbohydrate moieties on the surface of a bacteria. Unlike these two pathways, the alternative pathway does not require any trigger. It is constantly on. It's constantly on in all of us here at a very, very low rate, converting C3 to C3 water. And, and it's think of it almost like an idling car. It's ready to go. 
Now the goal of the three pathways is to form C3B because C3B is the central molecule which will opsonize the immune complex, the debris, the bacteria, and get them ready for phagocytosis. And in the process, when C3 is broken down to C3B, C3A is released, which is an anaphylotoxin, brings in inflammatory mediators to the site of injury. Now, if the trigger is going on and the system stays active, it will continue to move forward and through a series of steps, which involves the now the formation of an enzyme that converts C5 to C5A and C5B, the, the pathway will progress to, be, to for, form this well-known membrane attack complex. And the purpose of the complex is to really poke holes in the bacteria to kind of completely lyse you know, the, the foreign body that has invaded our system. Another important thing to remember is that no matter how the system gets activated, once that initial C3B is formed, it can really activate the alternative pathway pretty rapidly through the amplification loop, which is shown in the dotted line here. Because these proteins, the factors B, factors D, and proparidin of the alternative pathway can really combine with C3B to form this convertase and can rev up the alternative pathway really quickly, and which is how the system takes care of you know, foreign antigens and bacteria pretty quickly because once classical pathway is activated, it is slower, but it kind of can loop into the alternative pathway and the two together can take care of, you know, whatever they need to do. So the whole system really was designed by nature as a defense against infections for opsonization, for phagocytosis, for immune complex removal. And in order to keep it in homeostasis so that once your the infection or the immune complex is gone, the alternative pathway really needs to be reset. It, you know, because it's revved up during the process, we need to bring it back and get it back into its baseline status. And that is achieved by regulators of complement activation, which are factors H, membrane cofactor protein, CR1 and factor I. And we've talked more about how they do it and how the genetics involves in this. So the alternative pathway is really the primary pathway that if gets dysregulated can often lead to a number of injuries um, in, in, in our system. And therefore this needs to be tightly regulated uh, using with the help of these regulators. And the way these regulators work, there are two main mechanisms how these regulators com uh, control complement activation. One is known as the cofactor activity. So what happens in cofactor activity is that if that C3B has to be degraded, factor H in conjunction with factor I or MCP in conjunction with factor I or CR1, which is complement receptor one in conjunction with factor I. So factor I is a common cofactor for H, MCP or CR1. Two of these proteins will get together. They will break down that C3B into IC3B. This IC3B, once it's formed, it can no longer engage that amplification loop. It can no longer form the convertase. And this is a permanent or an irreversible way of regulating that system. The second mechanism of regulation is called the DK accelerating activity, whereby one of these regulators will accelerate the DK of the convertase. So the convertase is the C3BBB or C4B2A of the classical pathway. The protein comes in and separates these components out so that convertase gets de uh, decayed or degraded, and so the, it cannot function as the enzyme. However, this is a more reversible process because if the regulator moves off, that other component can join back and the activity can go on. And the reason we have both of these is that decay accelerating activity can happen very, very quickly, whereas it takes time for the cofactor activity to happen. So again, it's a very beautifully designed system by nature because we need to control the alternative pathway really quickly. You know, the enzyme is decayed and then, then quickly the cofactor activity sets in. So they really work together, but you know, they're two different mechanisms. So whenever we are talking about complement and disease, it's really all about homeostasis, it's activation and control. So if there is too much activation and it's insufficient regulation, it leads to a number of infections, inflammation, inflammatory diseases, one of which we are going to talk about today. And if it's controlled too much and there is insufficient activation, of course, your system will not work well enough to control the infections or the immune complexes and the debris and those kind of things. And what really mediates this imbalance 
are the genetic mutations, the polymorphisms, complement protein deficiencies, autoantibodies, which are acquired factors that can interfere with the function, and a number of triggers that, that uh, work in conjunction with many of these genetic mutations. And so moving forward before I kind of delve into the genetic part, I, I find the history of how the alternative pathway was discovered very, very fascinating. And, and I really, um, you know, I think it's a story that needs to get out. So uh, the alternative pathway was discovered by Lewis Pinamer, and it was almost 60 years after the discovery of the, of the classical pathway. So the alternative pathway is actually the way more primitive pathway that is present in even single-celled organisms. But because it was discovered after the classical pathway, it got its name as the alternative pathway. And it was Lewis Pelimer who was the first to propose that there are factors that are independent of the antibody that involves components like B and properdin that are distinct or separate from the classical pathway. At that time, there were not elegant techniques of protein purification or characterization, and he could not convince other immunologists of his time that what he was talking about was truly an alternative pathway. And opposition to his research at that time was led by a very famous uh, immunologist, Robert Nelson, who questioned Pelimer's data and said, well, what you're describing is just the classical pathway. There is not an alternative pathway. And because he was a prominent immunologist, his arguments and his critique of Pelimer's work, actually um, a lot of immunologists sided with him to the point that uh, there was a big argument in the second complement workshop in Walter Reed and people describe it as the Battle of Walter Reed. And after this workshop, Pelimer could not deal with the rejection of his work and he committed suicide by drinking a bottle of Barbitol in his own lab. And this was in 1957. After that, people stopped working. There was no interest in the alternative pathway. It was not until 10 or 11 years later that Pilimer's own, um, he was his own student, Li Pao, who went back to working on what Pilimer has had initially started. And at this time, he was actually able to demonstrate because of more improved techniques that there truly was a factor B, that there was a prepared in, and there were these proteins that were distinct from the classical pathway. That is when actually Pilimer got recognition for his work, and then several labs went back to working on the alternative pathway. And the nomenclature, which kind of seems so odd about what is D and why is there a random H and an I, that really came in the manner that Pilimer had identified them originally. What he called factory ended up being C3, which is the common molecule of the three pathways. So, and there is a lot of detail to the story, but you know, when I was reading this, there was a beautiful editorial that talked about this story, and it said failure can nurture, you know, growth and foster personal maturity. In the tech world, failure is often, you know, worn as a badge of honor because it's assumed that if there was a failure, it brought in some great learning opportunities. But in medicine, we, we don't regard failure in that way, and perhaps it's time for us to do that. And it's ended up by saying, you know, B is never a failing grade, except maybe at Harvard. So moving on to then our complement mediated diseases. A lot of these diseases that are shown here are mediated through this alternative pathway. And I've highlighted some of the ones that are particularly related to us um, to nephrologists uh, that include the TMAs, uh, uh, you know, a lot of it in organ transplantation, ischemia, reperfusion injuries. There's a lot of role of complement in IG nephropathy, C3G. And most recently, over the last couple of years, we've added on, we were looked at the role of complement in COVID-19 and published our review. So starting out with thrombotic microangiopathy for, for today, um, TMA, as you all probably already know, is a pathological process, which is caused by uh, the occlusion, a thrombotic occlusion of the microvessels, and that leads to an organ ischemia and damage. So it begins with endothelial injury, you know, brings in tissue factors, complement activation, and at that point there is uh, this clot that forms, red cells are lysed, and, and the, there's a thrombosis. The classic clinical features um, are described as the microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, so it's non-immune, it's actually due to mechanical fragmentation of these red cells in the blood clot, in the clot. 
and it's manifested as low hemoglobin, elevated LDH, and schistocytes in the peripheral sphere. Thrombocytopenia that occurs due to consumption in the blood clot, and of course, organ injury because of the endothelial injury and small vessel thrombosis. Again, a very important thing to remember about TMAs is that it's not a kidney specific disease, it's actually a systemic disease. Kidneys are the predominant organ involved, but you, you can, patients with TMAs can have strokes, myocardial infarction, there are GI TMAs. It can lead to necrosis of the tips of your fingers and toes. So it's really a systemic disease, and that's something we have to keep in mind. To the causes of thrombotic microangiopathy, the ADAM TS13, which is a deficiency which leads to TTP, the primary TMA, which is classically known as atypical hemolytic uremic syndrome and is the hallmark disease which is complement mediated. Secondary TMAs which may be complement mediated in several cases is a long list, includes hypertension, pregnancy, a number of drug induced TMAs, autoimmune diseases, lupus, antiphospholipid, you can have TMA and IgA nephropathy. Infections, of course, we all know about the sugar toxin, but a number of other infections, CMV, we see that in transplant, uh, other respiratory infections, influenza is a big one. And of course, as I mentioned, you know, we looked at COVID. There was a number of TMA cases that happened uh, during the COVID pandemic. The ischemia reperfusion injury that is seen in transplant. There are other metabolic causes of TMA which are non complement mediated, a B12 deficiency, G6PD deficiency, malignancy, cancers, chemotherapy, and, and cancer itself can cause a TMA. And then the you know, hematopoietic stem cell transplant, in addition to solid organ transplants, can all be associated with it. The purposes of the genetics that I'm going to talk about today, you know, the focus will be on the genetics of complement mediated TMA. But as I said, although this applies primarily to what we call AHAS, but, but there are a number of these other secondary TMAs that may be complement mediated, and genetics plays a role in several of these in varying percentages or proportions. So primary TMA occurs due to a dysregulation of the alternative pathway of the complement system, as I, as I showed you what leads to that dysregulation. And about 50% of patients with a primary TMA will carry a genetic mutation in one of their complement proteins. And these mutations are autosomal dominant, so they are heterozygous with reduced penetrance, which means that the mutation by itself may not be sufficient to manifest disease. There is an environmental trigger that is often needed. Patients can actually carry mutations in more than one complement gene, so it may be a diagenic inheritance. However, unfortunately, less than 50% of the identified rare mutations have a, have a known functional consequence. And when you get a report that is that describes the mutation, oftentimes that is based on various computational prediction models that have been used to really understand whether this mutation is pathogenic or benign. And despite these computational predictions, a lot of these reports come back reporting a variant as variant of uncertain significance. And that leads leaves the clinician, you know, in, in a conundrum on what do I do with the patient? I have a patient that maybe looks like a TMA but has a genetic mutation and it's a VUS. What do I do with that? And that's something I'm going to go into more depth in the next uh, several slides. It's important, the genetics is important because the risk of recurrence after a transplant, the risk of relapse in the native kidney in these patients is high, and often it depends on that underlying mutation that the patient carries. Oh, since 2011 is when you know the first um, complement inhibitor was approved, I think there's been a lot of advancement in how we understand what we understand about these diseases. And because of the availability of these drugs, at least we have been able to successfully transplant these patients because prior to that, we, it would lead to recurrence of disease. And uh, it was almost a contraindication. You couldn't give a kidney to a patient who had uh, an AHAS. So the, the pathogenesis of these genetic induced TMAs, it includes either a loss of function mutation in one of the regulators. So if, is, if you recall, these regulators are the ones that keep this alternative pathway in check. So if there's a mutation in one of these regulators that leads to them not functioning effectively as a regulator, that would lead to dysregulation of the pathway. Or there could be gain of function mutations in C3 or factor B such that these proteins become resistant to regulation. So the cofactor activity does not work and is not able to break down that C3B because there's a mutation in that C3. 
or the DK activity doesn't work because that convertase has been formed because of that mutation in factor B and this regulator cannot come in and, and DK it. So, so that is, those are two main kinds of mutations you would see. The table here below lists kind of the general known frequencies of how commonly we find these mutations in, in patients with AHAS. And prior to uh, the availability of the drugs, the risk of recurrence, as I mentioned, was very high, with the highest being with factor H, factor I and C3, and being relatively low with MCP and factor B. And the reason that the recurrence is low with MCP is because the membrane cofactor protein is a membrane bound protein. So when a patient gets a new kidney, it comes in with a new fresh membrane cofactor protein. So oftentimes these patients are fine. They don't need um, the drug, but the other regulators are um, uh, plasma regulators. They're, they're made by the liver. So MCP is the only one that the recurrence is low after a kidney transplant. And then in addition to these genetic factors, there could be acquired factors, such as the most common one being factor H autoantibody, which is often related to the genetic, uh, due to deletions in these CFHR related proteins. So if a patient has this big, large deletions, that can lead to the production of autoantibodies. And these factor H autoantibodies work by inhibiting the function of factor H. So they don't let the factor H work as a regulator, and that is how they, they cause dysregulation of the pathway. So doing this genetic testing to identify what is causing the, the, the problem in the patient, what is the etiology, is important because it will help you not only identify etiology, it confirms the diagnosis of primary TMA, and it provides prognostic information regarding what is the risk of progression to, for this patient to end-stage kidney disease if they, this patient is not treated, what is the risk of relapse, is this patient going to recur after a kidney transplant, and very important from the transplant standpoint, if you are looking for a living kidney donor for a patient who has TMA and they have a genetic mutation, it's very critical to test those donors, and oftentimes we don't accept living donors if there is a genetic mutation identified. So who are the patients who should undergo genetic testing? Of course, anybody who has a known history or has a TMA on a biopsy um, or, or, you know, there's a native kidney where there was, it was shown as AHAS and you're evaluating them for a transplant. But there are two other categories of patients that are extremely important to, to undergo testing. One of those, the younger population that presents with severe malignant hypertension should undergo genetic testing because oftentimes, these patients are labeled as hypertensive nephrosclerosis, as hypertension causing their kidney failure, which is not true in the majority of these patients in our experience. And the second category is young women who have lost their kidney to preeclampsia. So if they had during their pregnancy, if they had preeclampsia that was severe enough to lead to end-stage kidney disease, it is important to test those patients for genetic mutations as well. And of course, if you have a patient with unexplained kidney failure, those patients you would argue you could probably do a broader panel of genetic testing, but that would also include complement. And I include hypertension and preeclampsia because our own cohort at WashU, over the last about 10 years or so, we have now almost 75 patients that have been identified as a TMA. And we do genetic testing in these patients when we see them for a pre-transplant evaluation. And it was uh, eye-opening for us that several of these patients who came to us with this diagnosis of hypertension as the cause of kidney failure, ident we identified genetic mutations in these, as I showed here. And then the second um, highest number here was preeclampsia. So, and we presented this data at ASN as well. We're currently writing up our experience here. So I'm very, I really have a very low threshold for doing genetic testing for young patients who come in with hypertension leading to kidney failure. Genetic testing that we order can be done in any lab, CLIA certified lab that is available to you. And most of these labs will test for these 13 co common genes that I've mentioned here. It's important to remember, however, that there are about 55 or 60 complement genes, only the 13 for which there has been data associated with atypical HUS are tested. And then there is a separate uh, technique for which you assess that CFHR31 copy number. And that is done to see if there is a deletion in this hybrid protein because that's associated with factor H autoantibody. So your, your lab 
in general would test for all of these um, genes. And once it's the sequencing is done and um, uh, for so most labs actually do what is called whole exome uh, sequencing and then they look at these specific genes. And labs will then classify any variant that they have identified into one of five categories uh, that is based on the guidelines that are established by the American College of Medical Genetics. And it could be one of five. They might report a genetic mutation as pathogenic, likely pathogenic, VUS, which is a variant of uncertain significance, a likely benign or a benign variant. Now, if you have a mutation that shows up as being called pathogenic or likely pathogenic, you probably rest your case there. You know that that mutation is definitely deleterious and is, is the etiology of disease in your patient. However, like I mentioned, the problem arises when you get a patient that has a clinical history, but the mutation that is reported is a variant of uncertain significance or it's likely benign. So that is when that is when you I have to kind of go into the depth, kind of read the report more carefully, and I'll go over some pointers and what how you could do that. The other thing is there are labs that do function additional functional assays, biomarker studies that can kind of give you an assessment of the what may be going on in the complement system for that patient. So um, variants that are reported as a VUS are likely benign. There are several things that the report will tell you that you can kind of really read and identify. So the first thing you want to look at is what is the complement protein that the variant is in? Because if the variant is in a factor H, factor I, MCP, which are like those main complement regulators, you have to be really more mindful about knowing that those are your main regulators. And if the mutation is in one of those proteins, you have to... Um, you have to have a low threshold of moving forward and kind of being careful about identifying those. The second thing you can do, and often the reports will give you this information, is going into the literature to see, has this mutation been reported? Because there's a lot of literature out there where analysis of these mutations have been done, they've been functionally characterized, and although you would expect that the report will give you that information. There is new data coming out all the time. So going into the literature and just literally, if you type in Google factor I and you type the name of the mutation, it'll pull up re records for you for any, any other group that may have tested it and done some functional studies. The other thing to look at, and again, the report will tell you if it's a conserved mutation or not. And what that means is that if the change in the amino acid is at a, is, is, um, an amino acid that has been conserved across species, you know that that amino acid is important. Because if, and if that's a conserved amino acid across species and there's a mutation, it is more likely to be deleterious. So kind of finding those key words in the report kind of help you figure out. Because remember, the geneticists have to follow certain guidelines based on the ACMG and have to report the VUS or likely benign. But there are things inside the report that can really tell you that maybe it's really not a VUS. And looking to see whether this is a conserved mutation or not might help you with that. The other thing is to see how common or rare is the variant, which is reported as what is known as the minor allele frequency. So in general, it has been known that if it's a rare variant, which is defined as a frequency of less than 1% or less than 0.5% are generally pathogenic for, for primary TMAs. And then, you know, the, the next thing is probably a next level of understanding is, do we think this mutation could cause a loss of function or gain? And that I know can, you probably need a more specialist to kind of look at that because somebody can look at the structure of the protein, figure out where the mutation is, and do we think that's in the functional site of the protein? But one of the, the first things or common things and easy things you can do is just test the serum levels. If you have, say, a mutation in factor H, and if you check the level of factor H in your patient, serum antigenic level, and if the level is low, there is no need to go any further because you know that that mutation is causing a low level, and that's a pathogenic mutation. So one of the first things you can even do is just check a level of the protein in which you find the mutation. And of course, if you've done all this and you still don't have an answer, then like I said, there are labs that, including ours, that we can make these proteins recombinantly, we can do functional testing, we structurally model these proteins. In addition, there are labs that do biomarker testing and, and help you understand about the mutation. 
So these are certain tests in addition to the genetic testing that are recommended for all patients where you are suspecting a TMA. You would check a CH50 or an AP50 just kind of helps you identify the pathway affected. Like I said, measuring antigenic levels of protein C3, C4 commonly, but antigenic levels of the protein in which you've identified the mutation. If you have one of those deletions, looking for the factor-rich autoantibody, and these, these were defined by the, by, uh, the KEDIGO guidelines in 2013 and then revised in 2016. And, you know, we use this genetic data to, that is our approach of how we use all this information is how do we define therapy for our patients? Because if we find a pathogenic mutation in a complement protein, if there is a patient who's had a relapse in a native kidney or a recurrence in a prior transplanted kidney, even a patient who has a biopsy proven TMA in a native kidney, but may not have had a genetic mutation identified or has persistence of factor rich autoantibodies, we keep those patients on lifelong therapy. As I mentioned, patients with isolated MCP mutations, particularly after a transplant, patients who have had factor rich autoantibodies, but they have been successfully treated with, say, phreresis or rituximab, and you have been able to successfully remove those, those patients will discontinue treatment. But if you have a variant of uncertain significance, those patients need further testing, further analysis to define if they are those mutations are benign or pathogenic. If they're benign, you can stop the treatment. If they're pathogenic, they go into the left side and you have to keep them on treatment. And of course, treatment, as you all know, includes the anti-C5 drug, which was approved in 2011. It's a recombinant monoclonal antibody, which is directed against C5 that prevents the cleavage of C5 to C5 A and B. So remember, it prevents the formation of that distal membrane attack complex, which causes the endothelial injury. And more recently, the company has come up with a more uh, extended version, which instead of every two weeks, the infusion needs to be given every eight weeks. Um, and this is where, uh, just sorry, just to show you where the drug works, um, it's if in the pathway, it kind of prevents that C5A and C5B formation, so pre prevents the formation of the attract complex. So with, with that background, I wanted to kind of go into um, one case here, and I brought in probably one of, one of our most challenging cases because it kind of helps you understand the complexities despite everything we talk about and how straightforward genetics might be. I think, um, you know, there are still problems. So this is a real life case from our practice. This is a young white male who developed end-stage kidney disease when he was three years old. And it was thought to be an E. coli triggered HUS at the time at that age. At age 11, he got a kidney transplant. And in about a year or so, the kidney function worsened. He had acute cellular rejection. He went back on dialysis. In 2014, he gets evaluated for a second kidney transplant. This is the time when we saw him. And because there was this questionable history of HUS or E. coli triggered HUS, we did a genetic testing prior to giving him the second kidney. And there was a genetic mutation identified in factor I. This was an arginine to histidine change. It was reported as a variant of uncertain significance. So he gets a kidney transplant, he gets the drug, but at the time there was nothing known about the mutation and well, so we stopped the drug. We, it's a VUS, nobody knows what to do. A year about after stopping the drug, he again develops worsening kidney function. This time the biopsy shows acute cellular rejection and antibody mediated rejection. So no TMA in the biopsy, it's rejection. And now he has you know, failed the kidney and he's looking for a third kidney transplant. What do you do in this patient? There was never a TMA, there is this VUS that is sitting, there is this questionable history of HUS. So that's when we kind of really delved into what this mutation means. So step by step to go over, like I said, this is a mutation in factor I. Remember factor I is one of those cofactors, it's an important regulator of complement system. We start by looking, where is this mutation? So it's this mutation sits in the light chain. Light chain is that domain of factor I, which actually carries on that cofactor activity. So it is sitting in, a, in an important part of the protein. Next, we look at to see how common or rare this is. So remember, what is the minor allele frequency? So it was reported as 1.6%, which is higher than that 1% you would expect a mutation to be rare. So if you kind of go over that questionnaire that I said, said you, what complement protein is the variant is in? It is an important regulator. Yes, it had been reported in the literature before, but it is more common than you would expect. Is it expected to cause loss of function? Probably because it is sitting in an important part of the protein. 
So the first thing you want to check is what is the level of factor I, serum factor I in this patient? And the patient had normal level of factor I, which means he had a mutation, but it wasn't causing low levels. So that, okay, so that doesn't give you an answer versus if this patient had a level of say 20, you would have stopped right here and said, okay, this is a mutation it's causing low level. It's a problematic mutation, but we didn't get to that point. So the next step was functional analysis, and I'll kind of walk you through what we do. Basically, we make this mutation, like I said, in the lab. So we have a normal wild type or normal functioning factor I, and then we make this factor I recombinantly. So we have the wild type and the variant protein in our hand. Now we know that factor I causes, the, the function is cofactor activity. That means we want to see, is this factor I able to break down that C3B into IC3B as effectively as a normal factor I would? And so if you look at this Western blot and the top, you know, black bars, which are the alpha prime, they are the bars for C3B. And all these fragments that are marked with the red arrow are the fragments of C3B. So which means if a protein is breaking down C3B, you should have fragment generation. If it's not breaking down that C3B effectively, you're not seeing enough fragment generation. And so really what we are doing is we kind of, you know, uh, densitometry do, des you know, calculate the, the amounts of these fragments that are generated and we plot it. So we say that the wild type breaks down the C3B more effectively than this variant. And we then look at the generation of these fragments. And this gives us an idea that the variant is not breaking down that C3B and it's not generating the fragments as effectively as the wild type. And therefore, this functional analysis tells us that this variant has defective cofactor activity in when it functions with factor H. And remember, factor I is a cofactor for H, for MCP and CR1. So we actually go ahead and test it with all three different proteins. And you find the exact similar thing with complement receptor 1. As you can see, the bands with the arrows are much lighter when compared to the wild type. And so that tells you that this variant also does not function effectively with CR1. And interestingly, with MCP, it functions just fine. There is no defect observed. So with this functional analysis, we came to the conclusion that yes, there is decreased rate of cleavage of C3B uh, with this variant. And it has it is defective functionally with factor H and CR1. And the next level of analysis that we do is a structural analysis of these variants that is done in conjunction with um, Nicola Pozzi, who's a structural biologist at a university at St. Louis University. And what really Nicola does is that he will map these mutations on these three dimensional structures. So this is a structure on the left of a C3B, the factor H. This is the way the factor H sits on C3B and then factor I comes in and breaks down the C3B. So this is how the three proteins work. And if you see this mutation sets right where factor H and factor I are, are, are supposed to be together, the green and the beige. And he makes several assessments of if structurally we think this mutation could be a problem. And he, um, he made this um, evaluation that the arginine is important to stabilize the function. And when it changes to an histidine, it destabilizes the function, and which is why this protein, these two proteins don't work together. And so after going through this entire detailed evaluation, we said, well, this patient has a mutation in factor I. It is made normally because the patient has normal levels, but it's functionally defective with two factors. But now you go back to the clinical course and say, well, he did have HUS as a kid, and he had two kidney transplants, but he never had a TMA in any of those but he ended up having an antibody-mediated rejection. And that is kind of what kind of lit our minds is because AMR, or antibody-mediated rejection, can fall in the spectrum of TMAs. And it's quite possible that at that time it was read in an AMR, but there may be endothelial injury. And so based on this information, we know that if he ends up getting a third transplant, he's very high risk of either developing a TMA or maybe an accelerated uh, antibody-mediated rejection. And so... The idea would be to then treat this patient with the drug and potentially keep him on it for lifelong. And I have several other cases. In fact, I, you know, I, I don't think I had time to bring in another case where we did the similar testing for a mutation and it showed absolutely no defect. 
And so those are the kind of patients where you would say you don't need the therapy, you stop the drug and, you know, you can go on with your life. So um, this, uh, you know, flow chart here is kind of what I designed to really put everything together that I've mentioned. So if you have a TMA and you've First of all, it's important to recognize there's a TMA and the orange box talks about, you know, the different clinical features and lab features. If you've ruled out the other causes, you've looked at TTP, you've treated infections, autoimmune diseases, you've in cases of um, transplant, you've, you've taken away the CNIs, treated the AMR. And if you have a persistent TMA, those are cases where you absolutely have to look into complement testing, genetic testing and biomarker testing. And the biomarkers on the left, as I mentioned, you know, looking for C3C4, factor H, factor I, ant uh, antigenic levels, looking for factor H autoantibodies. Um, and then the genetic testing where you do a, um, the testing, if you have a variant, if it's a benign or pathogenic, I think that gives you a clear answer. If it's a VUS, that is when you have to take the next step and kind of either help make these mutations or, you know, figure out what, what needs to happen. And we've used, used this systematic approach over the years to, um, to uh, we have these cases published. And these are case series that are from our practice where we kind of really go into depth, just like I did. And the case I presented is in one of these papers that tells you that this is the clinical history. That's what happened with the patient. This is how we came, kind of came to defining it's, it's pathogenic or not. So with that, um, I want to say, you know, kind of a few things here that it's it's critical that patients who have a TMA, that those patients are recognized. And our knowledge of genetics over the years has really transformed this landscape of complement mediated diseases. And I think it's, it's important to widely utilize genetic testing, particularly in cases where I mentioned uh, that are not your classic AHAS TMA patients, hypertension, preeclampsia, any other aggressive TMA that can happen from any of the secondary causes, which is more aggressive than you would expect should undergo genetic testing. And a combination of genetics, antigenic, doing all of these biomarkers can really help assist the diagnosis, the etiology, and how long you're gonna treat these patients for. And, um, and, and the way the, you know, this field is progressing, I think clinicians, we will actually, and we already have several other anti-complement drugs that we can really pick and tailor to where the mutation and use the drug for that patient for that particular variant. And of course, you know, the biggest conundrum, hopefully affordable at a cost. I think that's the biggest problem that we have with this right now. If this, this was available um, at a lower cost, I think we would be probably putting a lot more patients on this. So with that, I'm going to stop here and um, open it up to questions. Thank you. That was a fabulous overview, especially that uh, that case that you demonstrated. Um, uh, if people have questions, please raise your hand and unmute yourself. Um, I'll I'll start off with a naive question: Is that you know when you had the um, uh, arginine to histidine uh, mutation that you described in that case? At that time, it was a VUS. Then does it take that publication after you publish? Then the AS yeah then switches it to a likely pathogenic? How does this work? Exactly, exactly. So so it, it, that's a great question, Swap. So when we make this, so ours is a research lab. We are not like a clear certified commercial lab that's doing it, right? So our report, what we do cannot go into a patient report. But what happens is when we publish this case, it goes into the, into the literature, right? Once it's in the literature, then a geneticist can go back and use that information and modify the report because the ACMG guidelines actually have functional data as one of their parameters. So then they can go back and modify the report and say, well, this was not a VUS and it is likely pathogenic. Exactly. So that's that's how this works. Awesome. Uh, someone in the conference room has a question. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for your excellent presentation combining physiology, pathophysiology and clinical science. My question is you limit, you, you put a limit there a little bit with regards to genetic testing uh, in correlation or, with, or in relation to a malignant hypertension. Is there any particular age you have in your mind which would be a limiting factor where you would not test any further? Yeah, that's that's a really good question. I, I think it's a little bit of a gray zone, but in my experience, if I see a 60 year old and above and they've had hypertension for years, maybe, maybe not. But anybody younger than that, I, I test. Now, why, I, that's not a defined threshold. That's just kind of what I've done. 
if I could a uh, following question on that would be uh, you were talking malignant hypertension and I assume that you were in your mind you meant uh, severe hypertension with target organ damage and features of TMA or did mm -hmm. you have on your mind just a severe hypertension with target organ damage? Yes, it was not always TMA. And I'll tell you, so classic histories that I have heard. The, so, and this is this has been a repeated pattern. I'll see a patient, he'll be, you know, young, 20 year old, or comes to us at 25, 30. And all he had was end stage kidney disease. When he presented to the emergency room, he'll tell us that I was doing fine. I was coaching my son on a soccer team, and then I had a headache. I went to the hospital emergency room. I was told my blood pressure was 200 over 100 and my kidneys had failed. I had to start dialysis. That's all the history you will often get in these patients. They've never been biopsied. They may not have the classical hematological features of a TMA. They, they came, presented with hypertension and uh, severe hypertension and then they ended up on kidney failure. So um, sometimes we will see patients where you may see the thrombocytopenia, anemia, but not always. If I could, two more questions. Yes. Could yes. you put a first is for you? And could you put a price tag on that complex genetic testing, at least in US, just for my own interest? You and mean second the, the, yeah, the genetic testing costs about um, now different labs have different pricing, but two thousand to two thousand five hundred dollars is what the pricing is. There is another lab that is come up in the last few years that I know does it at maybe like 1200 or 1500. So that's kind of the range of pricing for the genetic testing. So really very cost effective if you look really. If uh, the, yeah, the prices have come down considerably over the last several years. Mm -hmm. And my next question was to uh, maybe David Massacre here because he is dealing with this here or Todd Farhat if he is online. Uh, do we have this uh, uh, complex genetic testing available here and how easy is it to obtain it? Yeah, so I, I can talk about it. Thank you um, for, for a great presentation. I actually had a question, um, a comment. So here we get it because Alexion covers it. Basically, they they it's free, so we can have patients do the genetic testing and it's pretty much the panel that you put up there. Interesting. Um, uh -huh. That's that's usually tested for, uh, but the company covers it completely. So we mm -hmm. don't know how long that's going to last for. And otherwise, mm -hmm. it takes a specific request to the government, which can be quite tedious, very difficult to get arranged. Mm -hmm. um, so we have it right now and it's quite easy. Mm -hmm. And I guess, you know, one one comment, but who knows how long that's going to last for. And one comment I have. Um, so far, all the patients, and I agree with doing genetic testing and the, the benefit it can have, but to play devil's advocate, most often it's a VUS that we end up getting back. Mm -hmm. And um, and the patient has clearly, you know, usually when we see them, it's because they've had some form of renal failure with biopsy-proven TMA. Mm -hmm. So we're going to be able to treat them with ecolizumab anyways. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, usually... We're going to be giving it to them for a certain period of time, six to 12 months or so. Mm -hmm. And then there's going to be a trial off of it to see if they recur or not. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I, I'm guessing that a, a genetic test would rarely change that, um, that management. Mm -hmm. And even for transplants, there's, mm -hmm. um, there's some data out of, I think, Europe, maybe the Netherlands about five years ago, mm -hmm. where they did a case series of about 20 patients, mm -hmm. most of whom had known pathogenic variants and mm -hmm. were transplanted with living donors without recurrence in the vast majority of them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you could even make an argue, uh, argument that, true, there's the transplant component, but, you know, maybe you don't always need to give um, echolizumab depending on what the genetic variant. So it seems like there's still a lot of variability and even with pathogenic variants we don't know that they're always going to recur we don't know that we necessarily need to give them lifelong ecolizumab and i agree if ecolizumab costs a thousand dollars a year i don't think there'd be any question but you know it costs almost a million and uh and you know we have to consider that also I, it's for in the us for payment for patients obviously 
-hmm. but here, you know, for a public health care system too. Sure, sure, sure. No, so I think a lot of your points are very valid. I'll kind of tell you what my thoughts are on that. So the study that you're talking about, that's what the Cure I has study that came out from Netherlands. I think that's the one you're referring to. So, yeah. yeah so, and, and I know a lot of these studies about stopping EQ have come in from Europe. And very appropriately so, because similar to um, what you're just describing, they do not actually even have access to the drug a lot of times. If they do, they cannot keep them keep those patients on it. And so that is why a lot of data is coming from that. The group actually recently, just in the last uh, few months, uh, came up with another publication that was looking particularly at transplant patients. And if you look at that study, and I actually presented both that, those studies at the American Society of Hematology, and it, it was very clear, definitely from the latest study, that patients who have a pathogenic mutation had a much higher risk of recurrence. Even among the pathogenic mutations, there is a gradation. And I will say this because factor patients who have a pathogenic mutation in factor H are very, very high risk of recurrence. And those are patients that I would be very worried about taking off therapy, particularly after a transplant. Factor I mutations kind of fall more into the moderate category. And, um, and you do you may have some wiggle room of taking them off if you think if their creatinine has completely recovered after the first treatment, there is not a lot of fibrosis. Because if they do have a recurrence that is grown to slowly lead to more CKD, then you obviously need patients who are compliant and they can come back to you. So even among the pathogenic mutations, there is a little bit of gradation. And I would worry about taking pathogenic factor H mutation patients off therapy within six and 12 months. And um, the Cure I has study, like I said, did publish recently on their transplant experience there. Um, and well, you mentioned something earlier about the VUSs. Right, that you, I think that's yeah. what you were talking, that you would take them off after six or 12 months. So I yeah. think VUSs would help in both ways. I do think that if you understood whether it's pathogenic or not, it gives you that confidence. If you're taking patients, if a VUS is benign, you don't, you know that the patient's never going to recur. But if, a, if it is a pathogenic mutation and you're taking somebody off therapy, you have to be very cautious about how often and how frequently you're going to monitor these patients and make sure that they can restart if they recur. So I think. It does help define the course, the duration, the follow-ups for these patients is how at least we use this here. Uh, thank you. Very interesting. Thanks. Uh, Dar. Yeah, thank you very much. That was great. Um, I wanted to just clarify one or two points that David made about genetics. Um, the first is that there are actually two options of genetics in Ontario. One is through sick kids. And that is paid for if you're a um, OHIP paying uh, resident. Uh, that is free. That does cost somewhere between about four and five thousand dollars, but it's free to all patients. That's an older uh, way of looking at the genetics. They're not doing full sequencing, and um, I would say that it's a little bit inferior. They're not doing all the genes that you're describing, and Anuja. So. Uh, we do use the lab uh, through Alexion. Um, now, the, the Sick Kids Genetics Lab is a certified lab, whereas mm -hmm. the uh, testing that we're doing, the next gen sequencing testing, is through um, Western University and it is a research lab. It's not a certified clinical genetics lab, um, which is fine. I do find their reports excellent. Um, they're giving us most of the information that you are talking about um, in those reports. Um, mm -hmm. They will, for the most part, like I do send patients that present with malignant hypertension. I do send patients that are coming forward for transplant that have an unknown uh, cause of their ESRD or, you know, that hint like the young person with, you know, hypertensive nephrosclerosis. Um, mm -hmm. I've picked up a few women who have had you know, pregnancy associated kidney failure. Um, mm -hmm. I say pregnancy associated kidney failure because often it's not that classic preeclampsia, but they have kidney yep. failure catastrophically yep. within a week or two of, of transplant. Okay. And that's how we're picking them up. Right. Um, so those are our options. Um, mm -hmm. As David mentioned, we're, we really struggle with some of the functional testing. Um, mm -hmm. We do not have good access to even measurement of, you know, anti factor H, autoantibodies. Um, 
looking for C3 nephritic factors, which mm -hmm. I understand is actually quite complex and, and controversial in how you do those assays. They're not a mm -hmm. standardized mm -hmm. assay, but we do not have good access to that. We do mm -hmm. not have good access to measuring um, the complement protein levels or the split product levels. Um, so that, that does limit us a little bit here. Yeah. Um, I guess my question to you comes back, uh, or two questions. One is the variance of um, unknown significance, which we do see a fair amount. And mm -hmm. uh, um, we're not geneticists, um, but, and, but we're ordering these genetic tests. And so, mm -hmm. you know, it does make it a little bit difficult to know how to counsel a patient when, when we get right. those. Right. Um, I'm not sure if your background is, you know, uh, clinical medical genetics, or if you send these patients for counseling in that situation, yeah. um, just to try and um, access that. Um, you know, I can kind of read between the lines and, you know, uh, do <laughs> exactly what you you say is, is kind of what we're, how we're approaching it right now. Yeah. So that would be how, you know, how often do you use your medical geneticist? Yeah, that's um, that's great, yeah. Go ahead with the second question I'll ask. <laughs> uh, and again, part of that is access because um, the pediatric, they're pediatric, medical mm. geneticists and so they prioritize pediatric diseases over adult right. diseases for the most part um, and then the second question is actually about treatment um, mm. and uh, I'm just interested in what you think about the role of plasma exchange or plasma mm -hmm. infusions mm -hmm. in the short term to stabilize mm -hmm. patients yeah um, again we struggle a little bit um, uh, we have access to plasma exchange as soon as that Adam TS 13 yeah. Um, Come, level comes back showing that it's normal. Yeah. Um, our hematologists are fairly quick to say, well, there's no role for plasma exchange anymore, even though we're still going down that pathway to determine if this is a secondary TMA, if this yeah. is a uh, true atypical HUS. Do you think that there is a role um, for using plasma exchange uh, for non TTP patients uh, for stabilization? Yeah, definitely. So to get to the first question, uh, I have kind of just got fathered into this whole genetic thing, frankly. I don't have an official training in counseling or anything, and we do not have an adult geneticist uh, that we use. We I, I just do the counseling myself after I've really understood what the risks are. Yes, in the pediatric nephrology field, yes, they do actually have a geneticist exactly like you described, and they may send their patients to them. So no, we are not using a counselor. Uh, because, you know, I feel confident in what I'm understanding about this and I can counsel these patients myself. Um, in terms of, um, in terms of what was the second question you had asked? Oh, yeah, paresis. So, yeah, yeah I, I, you know, so I do think there is a role. I, and we, you, you know, by the time you've kind of made a decision whether this is primary, secondary, the genetics take two, three, four weeks to come back. I, I, do think that using it to just to stabilize is not unreasonable. It may not work in the long term. It's not reversing the process. But, you know, if you truly have a complement deficiency, I think it might replace some of that. So I do see a little bit of a role in that interim while you're really trying to figure it out, even if this is not TTP. And, and, and that is the way it happens even here um, in the native kidney field where you know, by the time you're starting to look at genetics, think about if phoresis is being done for these patients. So I, I would not say you absolutely don't need, I think there may be some benefit and that's how it was treated in the past before any of this came out. Um, so I think at least it stabilizes things to a little bit of an extent. Awesome, thank you. Uh, is there, we are at nine, but I think we can take one last question. Uh, is there someone from the conference room again with a question? Okay, I had one more question. This you mentioned that there is a refined version of eculizumab. Does that mean that uh, eculizumab uh, will be very soon generic as well? Oh, I wish. I don't. I don't <laughs> know the answer to that on what they're going to do. Frankly, they have the extended version. I know the company is really trying to get away with the two-week version and bring in rabulizumab, the extended version for. The ease of, you know, ease of infusions, and uh, so <laughs> whether they'll ever make it generic, I don't know. However, there are other companies that are coming into the field. There is a factor B in a better that is actually an oral BID drug, and they're just starting out their trial in AHAS, 
And I can only imagine if that pans out because they've shown benefit in PNH, then I don't know what will happen with um, <laughs> anti-C5. So, I mean, I, I you would have hoped that with all these companies bringing in complement and bitters, they would compete and bring the costs down and they would, and, you know, but I, I don't think that's going to happen. And I don't, I can't imagine it becoming generic, frankly. Yeah, true. On that note, uh, there are indeed many, many drugs on the horizon. Um, and, and we hope, uh, you know, one day the cost will come down. Uh, but on that note, thank you again, Dr. Java, for that wonderful presentation and great uh, discussion. Uh, I think we will be much more uh, friendly to doing genetic testing, which Dr. Farad and others have been, but maybe the rest of us also. Thank you again for, uh, so, for presenting sure. today. Anytime. Thank you. Nice to see you all. Thanks for all the questions. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Swapna.